Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming to my talk. My name, as Thomas said, is Robert Roger. I am a American, but I'm based in Amsterdam, where I work for a small data science and engineering consultancy called GoData Driven. And now, of the two aforementioned uh, career tracks at my place of employment, uh, I am a data scientist, which is to say, I'm not an engineer. So, what then is a data scientist like me doing on the store track stage? Well, the answer is this paper uh, The Case for Learned Index Structures, written by uh, Tim Krushka, who I think at the time was of Brown, took a year off, went to Google, and is now at MIT along with a team of collaborators over at Google. Uh, it made a splash at the data science water cooler back in December because it proposed what I think is a really novel idea, that machine learning, something we data scientists uh, know and care a great deal about, had the potential to replace uh, indexes in certain types of database systems, something I think and hope you hardcore storage systems engineers in the audience all know and care a great deal about. Now, not only was this paper interesting in a general sense, because at first glance, the two use cases don't really seem to match up. On the one hand, you have statistical inference, which is for learning patterns for the purposes of making predictions based on the future input. And on the other, you have data structures, which are useful for optimized lookup, but that's of information which you've already seen. But it was also interesting for me personally because while I l feel like I know a fair amount about machine learning, um, despite their cruciality in my daily professional life, I know next to nothing about database internals and wanting to understand this paper gave me a really good excuse to dive in and learn all I could about the subject. So I want to share with you today this idea and uh, let's hope that uh, Doug Turnbull had it right yesterday when he said that these sorts of autodidactic uh, experiences tend to lead to great talks. Whether or not that's true, uh, here's my plan. So first, I'm going to talk about uh, database indexes. And while I'm sure this will be old hat to most of you in the room, I want to do it anyway, both to ensure that everyone is on the same page, uh, but also to reframe how we think about just what it is that database indexes do. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk on, a, again, relatively high level about what it is that machine learning tries to accomplish and how this can be adapted to the database index domain. And lastly, I'm going to show how machine learning can be utilized to replace database indexes uh, in three different types of tasks. One, uh, range indexes, uh, two, point lookups, and three, existence checks. So if we're all ready, let's go. Let's start with analogy. Uh, a database is like a haystack, and I hope this analogy is not too English-centric for the crowd. Um, but as these databases consist of thousands, millions, or even billions of records, I think it would not be unfair to say that the challenge of finding specific records in our database is very much like finding needles in a haystack. And if we were to follow the naive approach, every time we need to look up a record in our database, we would have to comb through our haystack one entry at a time. Uh, until we either find what we are looking for or convince ourselves that what we're looking for isn't to be found. And this might be acceptable for databases with a few hundred records, but even at moderate scales, waiting for answers from our database, whether it's me doing some sort of analysis or you in the audience trying to populate the catalog of your online retail shop, that would take far too much time. And what we would rather have is some means of knowing precisely where our desired record is stored in that database and then skipping over all the other records to just touch that one. Uh, so because of this, uh, database systems often compared with an ancillary system called an index, whose function it is to tell us more or less where in the database our desired record is and to do it in an efficient manner. And how it works is roughly as follows. Say each record in our database is identified by a, a unique key. An index is a black box, or, and this is the insight we're going to need for part two of my talk, a model where the unique key goes in and a prediction for the position of the associated record comes out. Uh, by the way, this is very much like how card catalogs in the library used to work, uh, at least for those of you like me old enough to remember having to do high school research projects using one. Now, that's a rather abstract view, 
Uh, so we should ask ourselves, now if we were actually to implement such a system, what types of black boxes or models could be used? And to begin this discussion with a concrete task, what could we use to handle, say, range requests? That is, locating all of the records whose keys fall between two specific values. Now, anyone who's ever taken an algorithms course or perhaps recently sat for a tech interview uh, would probably think, well, if I can order my records by these keys, then I could probably use some sort of binary search to find each of the endpoint records and then grab everything in between, at least as a first guess. And so let's follow up on that hunch. We want to facilitate binary search. And so for our model, let's use a binary search tree. Now, for those of you who haven't seen one before, uh, the way a binary search tree works is as follows. For each record key, you make a node, and that's uniquely identified by the same ID as the record, and also carries the position of that record in the database. And then these nodes are stored in a tree structure where every node can have at most two children, which themselves are trees, and you have requirement that all the keys uh, in the left child tree will be smaller than the current node's key, and those in the right child tree will be larger than the current node's key. And if you further use one of the variations on a binary search tree that also do their best to keep the bottommost nodes all in the same depth, then you get uh, a guarantee as, uh, well, this is supposed to be an animation. Oh, there we go. Uh, is attempting to demonstrate that the maximum number of nodes that you have to examine during a lookup is on the order of log base two of n, where n is the number of keys in your index. So for example, if you had a million keys, this number turns out to be around 20, and for a billion, you're only dealing with 30. And this seems a great improvement over brute search. And you might rightfully ask yourself, well, why stop at two children per node, or even one key per node? And if you continue with that line of thinking, and again, think up some clever rebalancing rules to maintain an even tree depth, you'll eventually discover improvement to the B tree, seen here. Uh, ignoring the costs of scanning the keys inside an individual node, uh, which, well, because the number of keys in the node is much, much smaller than the total number of keys in our database should be justifiable, we've now guaranteed ourselves lookup times on the order of uh, log base k of n, where k is the number or the maximum number of children allowed per node. Uh, which means if we go back to our previous figures and we say we allow 100 children per node, now for a million records, we're down to a tree depth of three, and for a billion, we have a solid five. And with this, we seem to have optimized the lookup complexity of the problem, but having a node for every record also can perhaps be seen as overkill, and likely there's room for optimization in terms of space requirements. And this leads us to the third and final improvement we can make, which works as follows. So we take our sorted records, and we divide them up into continuous groups, which we call pages, of a fixed size, which we call the page size. And then we store in our index not every key of every record, but only the first key of every page. And then this allows a great deal of space efficiency. Um, and though our index now only points to a page and not to a record, meaning that after we've finally descended the index, we still have to perform a search on the page uh, since we choose the page size to be, again, tiny in comparison to the size of the number of records, on the balance of increased computation versus decreased storage, we still come out in the black. And with this third improvement, we now have modulo some optimizations involving caches, arguably the, the most common type of range index out in the wild. And it's this last improvement, making our index sparse, that I think really makes the analogy of index as model work. And the reason is, when we think of the word model, we, really, we typically think of something that makes predictions. And then these predictions have associated errors. And with binary search trees and B trees, we had the notion of prediction. Uh, that is, where we could find the record. But now with sparsity, our model predictions gain also the notion of error. As the prediction is not of the exact location of the record, but of its page. Further, these errors can come with hard guarantees. After all, the record, if it's in the database, is definitely not to the left of the first record on the page, and it's definitely no more than page size, page size records to the right. And all in all, we have now a very nice system in that we've got hard guarantees both on prediction complexity 
and uh, sorry, compute complexity, and also on error magnitude. And seeing as how B trees have been around since 1971, surely one might think, no, nothing could really work better because if there were, then that newer technology would have long ago replaced the B tree as the model of choice for range indexes. Except that they're not necessarily the best option out there. And here's a simple counterexample, which I should mention uh, also comes straight from that paper. Say your records were of a fixed size, and the keys were to be uh, the continuous integers between, let's say, 1 and 100 million. Then we could have a constant time lookup uh, in our database simply by using the key as an offset, perhaps minus 1. And of, the, of course, this is not the most realistic example out there, but it serves to illustrate the following point, that the reason why B trees are so widespread in generally available database systems is not because they're the best model for fitting your data distribution, but because they're the best model for fitting unknown, or let's call it the average data distribution. Of course, if your database engineers were to know your exact data, data distribution, they could engineer a tailored index, but this engineering cost would likely be too great for your project and would also be unrealistic to expect from a database available for general use. So thank your Redis's, thank your Postgres's, etc. Which leads us to the following wanted ad. What we want. We want an index structure tailored to your particular data distribution, which can be automatically synthesized to avoid engineering costs, and which comes with hard error guarantees. As otherwise, the performance gains we get at prediction time might be lost at seek time. So what could fit the bill? Well, as you might have guessed, the answer, according to Kraschka et al., is machine learning. And as for the general reason why, recall that what we want the index to learn is the distribution of keys in the key space. This distribution is a function, and it turns out that machine learning is really good at learning functions. In particular, the class of machine learning algorithms called neural nets, which form the basis of all the deep learning you've been hearing about for the past three years. In fact, machine learning algorithms are so good at learning functions that data scientists and other practitioners of machine learning typically introduce restrictions on the allowed complexity of trained machine learning models simply to keep them from learning the data too well. And here's an example of what I mean. Say the function uh, you want to learn is here represented by the blue curve. Uh, in machine learning problems, you don't know uh, a priori what that function is, but you can make observations of that function, here represented by the uh, yellow dots. And by the way, the reason why those yellow dots don't actually coincide with the blue curve is because uh, these observations are, in machine learning problems, corrupted by some sort of noise. And if we can sort of make this uh, grounded in reality, here's an example. Let's say we're trying to fit the function of apartment prices here in Berlin, and our observations would include information about uh, the number of each rooms or the area in square meters or the distance to the metro for each of these apartments, uh, and then together with the actual historical sale prices of those apartments, uh, whose deviations from this latent price function could be explained by, let's say, the prejudices of the buyer, sorry, the seller, or time pressures experienced by potential buyers, etc. So now our machine learning algorithm would then make a guess about what this function could be. Uh, it would then use the observations together with some measure of loss to calculate an error on that guess, and then consequently use the error to make a better guess, and so on, until the change in error between guesses falls below some tolerance threshold. So we try to fit curves of varying complexity to these observations. The most simple, uh, shown here in blue, um, well, we, we see that even with the best selection of the parameters for that function, the resulting curve is unable to approach the vast majority of observations. Uh, a machine learning practitioner would say that in this case, the model is underfitting. And this arises when the allowed complexity of the model is not sufficient to describe the function underlying the observations. The most complex curve here, the green one, uh, this is also doing a terrible job, but for a different reason. Uh, this one is trying to pass through all of the points, no matter how illogical the resulting shape. And this phenomenon is called overfitting, and what's happening is that the machine learning algorithm is fitting not to the latent function, 
but to the noisy observations of that function. And remember this because that'll be important later. So we need some curve whose complexity is somewhere in between the blue curve and the green curve, uh, which is here shown in orange. Uh, and actually finding that perfect balance between underfitting and overfitting is one of the hardest parts about doing machine learning. Okay, so that was an example of using machine learning algorithm to fit a simple function. But actually, machine learning algorithms are capable of fitting immensely complicated functions of hundreds of millions of parameters. Uh, Google Translate, Facebook's uh, facial recognition software, and DeepMind's AlphaGo, these, are, these all boil down to machine learning systems that have learned incredibly complicated functions. So we see that machine learning is useful for learning functions. How do we apply this to the database domain? So let's say the situation is the following. One, our database records each have a unique key, and, all of, and the collection of all these keys is orderable. Two, our set of records is held in memory, sorted by key, and is static. Where by static, I mean actually static, or perhaps only updated infrequently. So you have, let's say, a cold storage or a, a data warehouse or something like this. And lastly, we are interested in read access to this database, and we're interested in range queries. So given these conditions, here's another function learning situation more along the lines of what we're interested in doing. Say we have our keys. Uh, it's a little difficult to see here. But we have these pink lines representing keys and key space. And they're spread out in some way amongst the allowed values. What we're learning is interested in learning is this. It's the key distribution. And please forgive the lack of rigor in my illustration. Um, so now machine learning algorithms could learn this naked distribution perfectly well. It's a machine learning task called density estimation. But actually, from an engineering point of view, the function we would rather learn is the cumulative key distribution. That is to say, we want to give our model a key, uh, and we want to have it predict, say, that this particular key is greater than 25% of all the keys according to their ordering. Because this way, we immediately know that we would skip the first 25% of the records in our database to retrieve the record associated with that key. Now, what I just described about learning distributions could be termed normal machine learning. However, there's a very important difference between our database index scenario and normal machine learning. In normal machine learning, you learn a function based on noisy observations of that function and then make predictions for input values that you haven't seen before. So for instance, going back to our Berlin apartment pricing model, uh, we were fitting this model based on historical prices of sold apartments. But actually, the reason we want to use this model is not to explain apartment prices in the past, but rather to make predictions of the price of an apartment uh, in the future, whose exact combination of features we haven't seen before. But with an index model, not only are your observations of the keys noise-free, uh, but when it comes time to make predictions, you're actually going to make predictions on inputs the model has already seen before, namely the keys themselves. And then this break with normal machine learning methodology means, in fact, that, this situation, um, that in this situation, our observations and the underlying function we're trying to learn are one and the same. That is, there's nothing really distinguishing the blue curve and the yellow dots, which in turn means that in our previous example, we actually would have preferred the highly overfitting model that wildly jumps about because it always predicts what it had seen before and because there are no values of the function that the model hadn't seen before. Additionally, this break with traditional methodology gives us hard error guarantees on our predictions because after training our model, we'll only be making predictions on what the model has already seen. And because the training data doesn't change, to calculate our error guarantees, all that we have to do is to remember the worst errors that the model makes on the training data, and that's it. Now, I mentioned earlier that a machine learning uh, algorithm particularly adept at overfitting is the neural network. So to test their idea, the researchers took a set of 200 million web server log records, trained a neural network index over their timestamps, and examined the results. And what did they find? Well, they found that the model did terribly in comparison with the standard B-tree index, two, in two orders of magnitude 
slower for making predictions and two to three times slower for searching the error margins. Now, the authors offer a number of reasons for the poor performance. Much of it could be attributed to their choice of machine learning framework uh, for both training and for making predictions, namely Python's TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow was optimized for big models uh, and as a result has a significant invocation overhead that just killed the performance of this relatively small neural network. Uh, this problem, however, could be straightforwardly dealt with. You simply train the model with TensorFlow and then you export the optimized parameter values and recreate the model architecture using a faster language, let's say C++, for actually making predictions. But there was another problem, less straightforward, which was that though neural networks are comparably good in terms of CPU and space efficiency at overfitting to the general shape of the cumulative data distribution, they lose their competitive advantage over B-trees when going the last mile, so to say, and fine-tuning their predictions. So put another way, with a sufficient number of keys from 10,000 feet up in the air, the cumulative distribution looks relatively smooth. But when you zoom in, uh, uh, in you see that the distribution appears relatively grainy. Now the former situation, when the curve appears smooth, that's really good for machine learning. But when it's uh, quite grainy like this on the right, that's quite bad. So the solution of the authors was to replace that single monolithic model with something that looks like this, which they called their recursive model index. Uh, the idea is to build a model of experts such that the models at the bottom are extremely knowledgeable about a small localized part of key space. And the models above them are really good at steering queries to the appropriate expert below. Uh, note, by the way, that this is not a tree structure. Um, multiple models at one level can indeed point to the same model at the level below. Now, this architecture has three principal benefits. One, instead of training a single model, based on its accuracy across uh, the entire key space, you now train multiple models, uh, each accountable only for a small region of the key space, which has the net effect of decreasing overall loss. Number two, complex and expensive models, uh, which are better at capturing the overall general shape, can be used at the first level of experts, while simple and cheap models uh, can be used on the smaller mini domains. So uh, in this case, we can use a neural network at the top to make the first initial assignment. And then afterwards, we can use something similar like linear regression. And three, there's no search process required in between the stages, like in a bee tree. Uh, remember, uh, I sort of glossed over this, but when you're searching a bee tree, Every time you hit a node, you still have to search the keys in that node before you figure out what child you have to go to. Which means that model outputs are simply offsets, and as a result, the entire index can be expressed as a sparse matrix multipl multiplication, which means that predicts occur with constant complexity instead of on the order of log uh, sub k of the number of keys in your index. So I should mention up to now that we've been discussing the B-tree database indices as though they were strictly for looking up individual records. And while they are adept at that, their true ability lies in accessing ranges of records. Remember that our records are sorted, so that if we predict the predictions of the two endpoints of our range of interest, we very quickly know the locations of all the, ex of the records we'd like to retrieve. So a logical follow-up question could then be, are there other index structures where machine learning could also play a role? And that's the subject of the third section of this talk. I'd like to now talk about two additional types of index structures, uh, hash maps and boom filters. So let's start with hash maps. Uh, in contrast to tree based, uh, sorry, B tree based indexes, which can be used to locate individual records, but whose strength is really to quickly discover records associated with a range of keys. The hash map is an index structure whose sole purpose is to assign individual records to and loader later locate in an array. So let's call it a point index. Viewed as a model, we again have the situation where 
key goes into the black box and record location comes out. But whereas in the previous case, the records were all sorted and adjacent to one another, in the point index case, the location of the keys in this array is assigned randomly, albeit via a deterministic hash function. So what typically happens is that multiple keys are assigned to the same location, a situation known as a conflict. Thus, what the model points to may not in fact be a record of all, but let's say a list of records that needs to be traversed. And now in an ideal situation, there are no conflicts, and then lookup becomes a constant time operation and no extra space needs to be reserved for the overflow. But in the situation where a number of keys equals the number of array slots, simply because of statistics, collisions are unavoidable using the na naive hashing strategies. And collision avoidance strategies cost either memory or they cost time. So what we want from our hashing model is to make location assignments as efficiently as possible. That is to say, we want to fill up every available slot in our array. So to do so, the proposal of Kashka et al. is to, again, have the machine learning model learn the cumulative D key distribution. That is to say, the model predicts that a particular key is greater than, say, 25% of all keys, and then the hashing index tries to insert it 25% of the way along the available array slots. And of course, should there be a collision, which is bound to happen, if there are fewer slots than keys, um, the regular collision of resolution techniques could still be applied. The point is that by avoiding empty array slots in the first place, these costly collision resolution techniques will have to be used less frequently. So that's hash maps. Moving on to Bloom filters, uh, we are now interested in an index structure that indicates record existence. So let's call it an existence index. Specifically, a Bloom filter is a model which predicts whether or not a particular key is stored in the database, with the additional requirement that a prediction of no have an error of zero, and a prediction of yes have some error, but this error can be deterministically mitigated, typically by giving the model access to either additional compute and or additional memory. From a machine learning perspective, this seems like a job for a binary classifier. That is, a model which predicts a percentage between 0 and 100 and has a threshold value such that predictions above that number are classified as being in the database and predictions below are classified as not being in the database. Uh, and so just as in the range and point index scenarios, we have to break with standard machine learning methodology, uh, but this time we do it in a different way. Specifically, uh, usually when we train a binary classifier, we feed the model examples of both classes, but in this case, we only have examples of the positive class, that is to say the keys which are in a database. Uh, so the first trick we have to use is to just make up some fake keys. Uh, that is values which come from the allowed key space, uh, but what are not actually used by our records. And then these fake keys we add to the collection of real keys, uh, and then we use this combined data set to train our model. The second trick we use is to adjust the threshold value to match our desired false positive rate. Remember, the set of keys is static, so uh, we just keep changing that threshold until we reach that desired number. Uh, we'll, of course, still be left with a false negative rate, which, remember, we need to get down to zero. So trick three is to actually just make a separate Bloom filter, a traditional one, which will be applied to all the keys predicted by the machine learning model to belong to the negative class as a double check just to ensure that we get that uh, negative false, sorry, that false negative rate equal to zero. And while that might be seen as a sort of cop-out and talk about using machine learning to replace database structures, uh, we, still, uh, yeah, we still greatly reduce the resources required to implement our existence index. In particular, because Bloom filters scale linearly with the number of keys they're responsible for, uh, and given that the number of keys uh, our overflow Bloom filter will be responsible for scales with the false negative rate of our machine learning model, even if the binary classifier has a 
let's say 50% false negative rate, we've managed to reduce the size of our bloom filter we need by half. So I've told you about machine learning models and how they can be used to supplant or complement uh, bee trees, hash maps, and bloom filters for the purposes of range, point, and existence indexing, uh, respectively. What I haven't told you is how well machine learning-based index systems held up against their classical counterparts. <coughs> so, uh, now, how were uh, Krashka and all's benchmarking results? Well, the results were good, at least uh, according to Google. And while I don't have time today to go into the details of the benchmarks, and nor am I, as a data scientist, really on solid enough footing to be able to evaluate the appropriateness of the tests that they performed, I think I can confidently say that this idea has opened up the possibility for new research programs, which, especially given the increased likelihood for the inclusion of machine-friendly, uh, machine learning-friendly GPUs and potentially even TPUs in commodity hardware, may very well result in the adoption by future database systems of the ideas I talked about today. Rounding up, I'd like to thank Tim Kraschka, Alex Botel, Ed Chi, Def Dean, and Nicholas Polizotis for their novel idea. Uh, I'd like to thank my employer, GoData Driven, for flying me out here and let me speak uh, to you on company time. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention. And now if there is any time for questions, I'd be more than happy to field them. We've got some time for questions. Are, are there ones? There's one here and then over there. Let's start here. Hello. Interesting, Hi. interesting talk. So one of the things you mentioned is that your model learns on all the things in your database, but in a usual production use case, you're always inserting records. So does that mean every time you insert a new record, you need to be retraining your model? Uh, that's correct. So the scenario given in this talk is that, as you say, that the, it's, it's static for some time frame. The authors of the paper do address the concern of uh, doing either inserts in the middle or appends on the end. <coughs> uh, yes, uh, when you um, have new data, you have to retrain your model. Um, so they propose a couple solutions. One, you either have like, sort of like an overflow buffer and then only periodically update. Two, your database in the first place only needed to be updated, let's say, one time at night. Uh, and so that wouldn't really interrupt your system. Um, and three, they also consider the idea that um, you could insert, but then you don't just insert a single record like you do in a tree. You have to insert, let's say, some additional block of space, uh, which you determine based on your previously calculated cumulative uh, key uh, distribution. So you make the assumption that this distribution is the same regardless of how many keys you enter in the future. All right, more questions. Can you please pass this down? Thanks. So a little bit similar question. The data set was static, but what happens with the cold start? So you still need to have some sort of distribution at the beginning to train the model. And usually when you have a use case, I'm starting, I have a business model, but no data. How I will build the index without the data? Uh, the point is that you don't. So this particular use case is when you already have some body of data and then want to build an index on top of it. Thanks. I'm not saying, uh, I, the authors don't propose that this is the solution for every use case. They just say that here are the specific use cases where it could be uh, advantageous. So maybe I'll ask another question. Is all of this still purely theoretical, or is there already like a database out there or in development that will be able to take this kind of like modeled index and yeah. put it to use? So uh, I said this paper came out in December, so December 2017. Uh, to the extent to which I, un I know and the public knows, this is all relatively theoretical aside from their, uh, their tests. Uh, and then um, part of what they encourage in the paper is simply that this should become a research avenue. That said, it's Google, and I wouldn't think that they would release such information so lightly. So my assumption is that there's at least some experimentations going on deep in the bowels of Google trying to implement this in production. But that's just a speculation on my part. All right, there's one more here. 
what kind of objects were used for the keys? Uh, right, so the, um, they had a number of test data sets which they spoke of. Um, they used, uh, let me see if I remember. <clears throat> so they made up uh, a set of integers based on a log normal distribution. They have a set of longitudes based on some map data. They had a set of document IDs, which were strings. And they had a set of timestamps, which were also integers. Um, now, I didn't want to talk too much about the results, but the results show that for integers, this performs much better. Uh, strings are when you have difficulties, and that comes largely because of uh, the challenges in representing variable length uh, strings as uh, keys in a uniform way. But yeah, so direct answer is index and strings is what they talk about, uh, integers and strings. Okay, let's take one more question, and that is here to the left. So uh, those... Uh model uh, indices, they are uh, being calculated on top of the data, like from the data. But has there been any research of actually, let's say, mapping an existing classic like B3 index to a model? Like uh, try to create a model based on existing indices? Uh, no, to my knowledge, no. All right, let's thank the speaker again.